All right, this week we're going to be talking about the critic and what it means to be a judge. So let's look at the role of the adjudicator. An adjudicator is just a fancy word of saying, a uh, fancy way of saying a judge, adjudicator. Um, and so to adjudicate is, or adjudication is looking at a piece of work from a judge's point of view for usually a competition. So when you're looking at a competition piece, uh, I want you to think about kind of the, the point of view of the judge. A lot of students get very intimidated by judges because they're getting, um, you know, there's a lot of high stakes there. Oh, am I going to make it? Am I going to not? Am I going to place first? Um, am I going to be last? It's, it's very stressful. But um, I think you really need to think of the judges as human beings. Um, to use a cliche, they put on their pants one leg at a time like everybody else. And they have to be sitting there with a piece of paper and looking at something subjectively and marking you on it. And looking at those actual rubrics, I find helps people to understand what they're they're marking. So we're going to look at the one act rubric. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Um, at the top it has uh, ratings. Um, I find for one act and for literary, having been a judge and having seen a lot of judges remarks that um, the ratings don't really matter that much as far as you can have a really, really nice judge who's really just doesn't want to take off a lot of points for anything for anybody and they mark all of the plays in the 90 to 100 range. Or you can have somebody who's just a little bit harsher and finds a lot of fault in everything and they're going to mark everything in the 70 to 79 or the 60 to 69 range. And at the end of the day, when it comes down to it and the judges go together, because you never have just one judge judging an event, it's always two or three judges um, judging an event, sometimes even more, that it, the, the overall score doesn't matter as much as what place that judge put you in. So if you had a really nice judge and they all, you know, every play was a 98 and a 99 and this one I liked a lot was a 100 and I put a smiley face on it. Well the 100 plays first place and it's the same number as the one that was rough and he said I hate everything that you've done and you get a 69 but you're in first place <laughs> and then you're still first place first place on both sides so um this doesn't matter as much as the place that you are actually put in first second third fourth fifth um but let's look a little bit at how they cut these points up these are the sections that are all worth 15 points, so they're worth the most. Um, the most important is ensemble. Do they work together as a group? Um, do they set good characters, individual characterizations, and um, their vocals? Do they uh, are they able to uh, are you able to hear them? Can you or they pronounce things correctly, um, and so forth? Okay, and those that's a lot of times where high school kids lose a lot of their points is in vocal interpretation. The person cannot, the judge cannot hear you, and if they can't hear you, they can't um, they can't judge you. Um, also, you have listening and response. So the judge uh, looking at how well you act, at reacting, acting, and reacting and your personal movement. But overall, they're looking for something that is, um, you know, are you working together as a team? It's the most part here. Then you have 10 points and five points awarded for a little bit more. Um, how does the overall picture look? This is the closest thing you're gonna get to tech because it's an acting competition. You're not supposed to even look at tech, honestly. Um, even though judges do anyway, but that's the 10 points that comes there and some what they'll overall affect a little bit more there, even though it's not really supposed to be that and the rhythm and tempo did they have good transitions in between scenes. And you can see there that you can be disqualified or you can get points off for um, going over time and so forth. And down here, ranking would be the most important thing on this whole sheet. Um, sometimes you get really good judges that give you lots and lots of commentary. I've had judges that stapled independent sheets to this. You know, they wrote handwritten notes on um, wonderful legal pads and then stapled it to their um, their scores. And then you have judges that come in here and they want, write nothing. Um, and that's always very frustrating to get a judge like that. But you never know what you're going to get. Um, let's look at the literary sheets. They're very similar um, for individual events, um, but also have their differences, obviously, for being um, 
you know, individuals. Um, we're going to look at the oral presentation score sheet, which is for uh, monologues and for duos, as close as things to dramatic writing we're going to get. Um, and if you look at the individual person score, you can see that there's fewer categories and that the most points go for the same type of things though, vocal technique, can they hear you? And um, how effectively or were you um, were you visual in what you did? So how well did you act basically and communicating that message? Um, a little bit less points to uh, preparation as an adequate introduction to the, to the piece um, at the front. So uh, these also go, these are nice because they're in all the categories. The essay one is nice just for a general essay it's kind of a nice rubric um but you have extemporaneous speaking so forth and all there so looking at the rubrics a lot of times can be helpful for students uh, make things a lot less intimidating for kids when they're competing all right so what makes a good judge uh, you know we know what makes a judge what makes how's it what makes a really good one um because you're going to try to take on the role of judge a little bit so um, to be a judge, you really need to be obviously honest and fair, and that means not sugarcoating and not just pointing out your flaws, um, like what I like to say, uh, sandwiching your your bad stuff. Um, I have to do this a lot um, when I'm talking to parents. It's a good life skill. <laughs> or talking to your boss or talking to anybody um, that you, especially if you have a job that you have to talk personally to people. This nice. Um, sandwich technique. There's another a cruder word for it that I'm not going to use in this PowerPoint presentation, but sandwiching your criticism between two compliments. Um, how this might work for a parent. I'm calling a parent about a student and I have to say something like, um, you know, I have to tell them that the student did not do their essay for my class and that, you know, now they have a zero. Okay, so I'm going to call up and I'm going to say some very nice things first. You know, hi, how are you? Is it a good time to talk? And then I'm going to say things like, you know, I'm really glad to have this student in my room. He's a really hard worker. I'm going to say something nice first. And then I'm going to slip in that that thing that I called about, which is uh, he didn't turn the essay in. <laughs> and then I'm going to follow it with usually a solution um, because I don't want the person to feel helpless on the other end of the line. You know, so I'm going to say something like, um, they have until Friday to get it back in. Can you just make sure that they're keeping on top of it? This is where you can find the assignment online, da, da, da. So I'm going to put a little helpful part in there. And the same thing goes with a piece. If you're addressing it um, and then you're judging it, you'd say something to the actors like, because a lot of times they sit down and they have judges talks afterwards. You say something like, you know, you did a really good job of working together as a group. You're a great team. You can tell that you really had fun up there and um, the action was really just bouncing uh, nicely. The rhythm was nicely done. But, um, you know, make sure that you are really doing well with your vocalization. Some of your lines were dropped and I couldn't hear you very well. Um, so uh, make sure you keep working on that and improving that with time. So. There you go. You got nice. You've got the criticism, and then you've got something nice at the end, or just a solution to what you're doing. And here's another example here uh, on the PowerPoint. You may find it's helpful to keep yourself a nice journal of, of movies that you watched or performances that you've seen live um, over the course of um, you know semester, just to keep track of um, and practice this skill because it's a it's a really good skill to have to be able to critically look at something and judge it well. Um, I've had students a lot of times that take pen and paper anytime we go to a performance because they want to jot down notes and write about it and talk about it afterwards with each other um, and say, you know, what was good about that? What was bad? What could have been done better? How can we adapt this to our stuff? It's always helpful to be looking critically at the world. Um, let's switch here's a little bit and look at our writing assignment for this week. It is over um, before and after is the name of it. Okay, so the inspiration comes from this wonderful uh, little poem by Lebo. It says, her presence was a room full of flowers. Her absence is an empty bed. So really just capturing in very, very few words the feeling of loss and uh, grief. Oh, excuse me, that's my phone. <laughs> um, and here's a more modern interpretation of this as a modern poet. He says, when she was here, Lebo, she was like a cold summer logger, like hot pastrami on cats on Houston Street, like a bright nickname on my downtown express, like every custardy honey from the old art books. She was a quadraphatic mailer and the perfect little gymnast. 
Now she's gone. It's like flat Coke on a Sunday morning. It's like melted Velveeta on white, eaten, listening, listening to Bobby Venton like the Philadelphia Eagles. Now, this is a very personal poem, and I'm sure that you don't get half the references. I don't get half the references. I don't know where Katz is on Houston Street. I know that lager is beer. I know pastrami is meat. I know that what an art book looks like, but I have no idea what he's talking about, custardy honey. Um, I know Mailer is a musician, but I'm not musician enough to know what quadraphonic means. Um, I know what flat coke sound tastes like. I know what Velveeta is. And I think there's a feeling here you get from this poem, even if you don't know every little reference, you kind of get the feeling of what he's putting there, that these are good things. Here's all the things that she was and she was good. And now she's gone and it's crappy. It's boring, like crappy cheese. Velveeta is not even real cheese. It's like crappy cheese on crappy white bread, you know, and I, I don't know who Bobby Benton or, and I'm not sports enough to know about the Philadelphia Eagles, but it's the idea that it's, it's crap. It's, I'm unhappy with my life because <laughs> she's gone. So it doesn't have to be a depressing thing. It can be a before and after that you're doing, um, where something is better. Um, um, but you, you need to have a shift, a change, something that happens that changes you ultimately. And we're going to use this little format, this little uh, before and after format as a journal. And as always, you don't have to keep with this format if you don't like it for your final piece. But for just generally, this is how we're going to start off as a sort of graphic organizer. OK, so you're going to say before whatever it is, it was like this and this and this and this. And now it has changed this and you don't have to put it has changed you and now the you know because it's and it's like this and this and this and this and again you don't have to use three you can use five you know likes it's completely up to you as you can tell here this guy used one two three four five six sentences here and one two three four here um at this part you kind of use you know go with it like you like you feel um here's another example um or two other examples. No, this is just one um, that you can read and, and look at and see what that looks like too. This one's a little bit longer than the um, Peter Williams piece. So you can see that, you know, you're, you're not constricted by, um, you know, exactly this, but it's, you're getting kind of the idea of um, this before and after. Um, do make it a, a significant shift uh, and it does not have to be from real life. It can be something, of course, fictional. It's always nice to write real life, but if you want to go out there and, and invent a character and, and, and base it on something different, you can as well. Um, this is another little short piece, and I want you to continue to work this week on your, um, we are moving towards 10 minute plays. So um, this may be something that you want to use. Your fear piece from last week might be something you want to use to sort of get into that um, piece and find that final 10 minute play piece. Uh, it's completely up to you. Uh, you can use the same scene you've been using throughout. I know a lot of people have just been like, this is my scene, and they've just made it longer, and that's perfectly acceptable. Um, if you don't want to use a new idea, um, make this your, your best scene. Um, but 10-minute play is is where we're moving towards. This is the very end of the semester, um, so basically we have this and an argument of essay, um, and that's the end of it. That's, that's all we've got. So um, really looking forward and saying this is how I want to end the semester um, with this this good piece of work, this before and after piece, um, this strong argument of essay that I'm going to write is going to be awesome, and this 10 minute play that will be my final awesome piece um, to show that I have learned uh, how to write, how to write well, how to write narratively, um, and how to create these beautiful scenes. Good luck writing this week, and I will talk to you tomorrow.